Here we are in eastern Nebraska at the last vestigial remnants of a now uh, destroyed and eradicated ecology. Okay, little fragments. You can see you got some uh, solitary dago right there. It's the race. There's so many goddamn golden rods. Quite exquisite when you get up close. Then over there, you can see just a field of Desmanthus illinoisensis with the DMT in the roots for all the Joe Rogan bros and stuff, you know? Looks like somebody dumped some trash over there. Can you imagine what that's like, though? I mean, this whole, I mean, everything around here is just cornfields, you know? It's basically a desert. Corn doesn't really benefit any, you know, there's there's no residual benefit to any of any the insects or wildlife. You know, whereas at one point, there, this place must have been thriving. Just with the diversity of flowering plants, uh, you know, benefiting uh, both the insect and animal alike. Anyway, let's keep moving on. Look at all that desmanthus, though, really. It's a lot, you know. You gotta love the prairie, though. What little crumbs of it are left. Okay, even when it's uh, invaded by uh, invasive uh, mulberry, morris species, and of course cannabis, which is really just everywhere here. The ditch weeds. Okay, now this is one of my favorites. This is a notable uh, prairie... Uh, a prairie king, if you might call it that. This is Silphium laciniatum, also known as the compass plant. Okay, you got quite a few species in the genus Silphium. I love all of them. Okay, C collectively known as the rosin weeds. They got a whole bunch of different common names, but I, I don't, I don't use them. The, the the common name for this, though, uh, we will talk about here. It's called compass plant, so named because the leaves supposedly orient themselves north or south. Uh, which I've never really found to be true. It's pretty variable, so don't go navigating by it yet. But uh, it is important to know that the leaves do orient themselves so that they're getting less sun exposure and thus less heat uh, during the middle of the day. So they seem to do most of their photosynthesizing, uh, you know, in the morning and the early evening hours. But let's take a look at the, at the flowers up here. Now you can see those filaries are quite distinctive, almost looking like some sort of damn uh, gargoyle statue on the edge of the cathedral or something, okay? Little demonic horns or something. And of course the margins of those filaries are covered in those, uh, that fringe, those laciniate hairs, okay? The whole damn plant is scabbard, like uh, many of the members of the sunflower family out here. They're very abrasive in a sandpapery like uh, texture to the stem, you could see that. Okay, important to note here is that unlike uh, sunflowers, uh, these flowers uh, only produce seeds along the outer ring, the outer margins of that compound flower right there. So the inner flowers are functionally staminate. Basically, they're just stunt cocks, okay? They're just staminate, they're just male, they're, uh, they're, they're sterile, at least in terms of uh, producing, uh, producing seed. And once the seed comes out, they just look like uh, it kind of a flatter version of a sunflower seed but with a wing around uh, the edge, you know, like a little uh, wing for a wind dispersal. To give it a little bit of uh, oomph when it, uh, when it falls out of that flower head, you can see the, the individual florets, little five-lobe tubes. Okay, but again, those filaries are quite distinctive. All the silphiums have, uh, have very distinct, uh, distinct filaries, okay? Integrifolium, uh, terebinthinaceum, this guy, laciniatum. Look at those leaves. Highly dissected leaves, okay? And this guy can, I mean, they really can uh, get aggressive. So if you're gonna plant them in a the garden, make sure you got space for them, or not. I mean, I kinda like, I kinda like the overgrown nature, you know? It's much better than the, the dead, depressing, bleak American lawn trademark. And again, these, you can obviously see these come back from a massive root in the ground every year. So there you go. Sophium laciniatum. Okay, here's a diminutive little bastard. Now, this is a member of the Cesalpinia, a subfamily of the P family for basically. This is Camacrista fasciculata, kind of looking like a senna. But, uh, and this is a tiny shit. This is a tiny little guy just coming up amongst the grass. I've seen him on uh, some of the sand prairies in the, you know, the kind of rolling sand dune areas in uh, northern Illinois. And they, they become a dominant plant there. But this is the only one I've seen so far. Got that nice uh, pinnate, uh, sensitive plant look in uh, leaf venation. I only say sensitive plant because uh, for some of the people who are not as well acquainted with Fabaceae, uh, you know, you see those leaves. And uh, I guess they just associate it with the sensitive plants. Maybe you've seen them in like the gardens, the garden, uh, the conservatories and what the shit, you know. But uh, quite distinct. 
Whenever you see that foliage, most of the time it's going to be Fabaceae. Maybe if you're in the American deserts, it might be Zygophilaceae. You get a couple uh, couple members of Zygophilaceae, the creosote family down there, that get the foliage like this. But but 90% uh, of the time, it's going to be Fabaceae. But uh, those flowers, very distinctive uh, brown stamens in there. Five yellow petals. And then, of course, the fruit uh, looks like a legume. Okay, now we're walking through all the andropogon. I want to show you this plant over here. It's nowhere uh, near as common as it should be. First time I saw it was when I stopped to take a piss at a rest stop in Iowa. This is a beautiful, uh, a beautiful sage, beautiful prairie sage. This is a salvia azuria. Should certainly be planted out in gardens more because it doesn't seem to be uh, doing very well for itself in its former habitat. Again, which has mostly been destroyed to make way for. Uh, oceans of corn most of which goes to feed a uh, livestock anyway oh god it smells amazing you can see those uh verticillasters inflorescences just whirled around the stem sessile inflorescences whirled around the stem sessile flowers excuse me with that uh, very large landing platform for pollinators that lower lip and that bilaterally symmetrical corolla God, it smells incredible. You can see the little trichomes on the sides of that calyx. Each one of those the calyxes will have uh, two to four seeds inside. You can see the foliage is opposite, like uh, many members of the Lamiaceae, the mints. Okay, and you got a square stem too. Not all the mints have square stems, but a lot of them do. Which smells smells quite the uh, smells quite pleasant. And again, this is a this is a tall. Tall guy, tall banger right here, perennial, comes back from a root. You could probably, I bet Prairie Moon Nursery or some of those, some of those nurseries have it. Look at the leaves. Very, very uh, elongated and linear. Real banger of a plant right here. And again, it's, it's surprisingly rare. You don't see it that much. At least I don't see it too much. I don't see it, I don't think I've ever seen it in Illinois. It's there, but I've never seen it. At least not the wild. Anyway, there you go. Salvia azuria. Only two plants here. Don't know why there's not more. You know, I've never seen I've never seen a bunch of this stuff growing in the same place. I've never seen large populations. Just tiny, you know, individuals scattered here and there. You know, one including on the side of a rest stop uh, next to a couple piss bottles and a, a bunch of garbage. That was, uh, I think it was near Rapid City, Iowa. I don't know, but should be growing more. Not sure where you could get seed. Like I said, probably Prairie Moon's got some. Look, here's that Mispon Americanus, Fabaceae, obvious fabid right there, tiny pink flowers. Tiny pink flowers, but massive ovaries. Here, wait, let me see if I can get one of those flowers. Look at that. Look, tiny, just your typical, uh, you can see the, the veined banner back there with those purple, those uh, darker maroon striations on it. You know, typical banner wings and QP flower. Then you got this massive, uh, massive legume down there. But it's a native, that's nice. Then you got more, uh, more salvia over here. More of that salvia azuria. Okay, and it doesn't look like it's being outcompeted by anything. It just, you know, it looks like it's holding its own. It's just pretty dry. But still, I don't know why there's not more. Probably because they don't burn. You know, you get you get some more burns, I bet you get more salvia. But, you know, the ecology's all fucked up out here in the Midwest, so what are you going to do? More of that nice euphorbia marginata. Oh! Swollen green ovaries. <laughs> Swollen green ovaries. Of course, uh, all the euphorbs have a very distinct floral morphology. They have a uh, cyathea, singular cyathium, instead of uh, your typical, you know, your typical flower. They don't have any petals. Very, very reduced flowers. Okay. The inflorescence is a cyathium. Okay, so it looks like a single flower is actually multiple flowers, with, uh, you know, they're mo they're monoecious basically. You got the. Uh, you get your female flower right there, and then just these tiny... Let's see if I can find some of the uh, staminate flowers. Maybe up there. Yeah, there you go. See those little anthers right there? And again, those are not petals. Those are just bracts. They're just modified leaves meant to attract uh, the pollinators. Okay, but they got this nice variegated texture. Pretty nice right there. Pretty nice plant. Okay, pretty common. Pretty common if you get to the right prairies and, it, you know, there's enough... Uh, 
there's enough uh, lack of competition. You know, I got some burns or something. Got some uh, Vernonias again. Okay, lit up when they're going off, but these aren't these aren't going off. Lit up uh, pink and magenta when they're going off, but these aren't. Oh, there's a nice seed there, though. There you go. Here we go. Junipers, Virginiana. Perfect illustration of why you need to burn. Because otherwise you get the eastern red cedars, the Junipers, Virginiana, just taking over forming a monoculture. It's native, okay, but it was normally kept in check by, I don't know, the last 15, 20,000 years of prescribed burns, at least. But, uh, you know, see, now it just gets out of control. You end up with less diversity. So the disturbance creates the diversity. If you're going to take anything away from from fucking around on the prairie, botanizing, looking at plants and whatnot, trying to cool yourself down from the misery of reality, <laughs> from, from the anxiety and misery of modern reality. Disturbance creates diversity. There you go, there's that. All right, here we go, moving along. A little Caesar's truck, that's repulsive. That's, that's about the last thing I want to think of when I get to hell. Uh, it's, those are going to be dotting the freeway. Anyway, let's go Iowa, here we go. Number one for coronavirus cases in the United States right now. Hitting it big. Good job. I'm proud of you. But I want to come over here and show you uh, this plant growing on the side of the goddamn uh, I-80 interstate right here. See, no one's honking at me. I'm, maybe these truckers want me to flash them. This plant over here, we got a species of Grindelia. Looks like Grindelia squarosa, though. It is variable. Yes, that is correct. Growing on the side of the goddamn freeway where traffic's running 80, 85 miles per hour. We got the Grindelia squarosa. Just, uh, you know, lying in the... Oh, it smelled like cow shit right there. Just lying on the edges of the interstate for miles. Miles upon miles. You know, catching all the runoff and shit growing on the side of the road. Pretty impressive. That's correct. The ass rash plant growing on the side of the interstate in Iowa. Normally you think of Grindelia as a western genus, but it seems to be thriving here.